so this is very exciting for me. Um, a film that I put on all the time to make me smile, that I just enjoy so much, um, is Terrorvision. People are fed up with me talking about it. I talk about it all the time. I have it on. Uh, I still have it on VHS. Um, it would be underselling my guest today if I was to just talk about Terrorvision. He is known for subspecies, and there are so many great films that people really do enjoy. But you'll forgive me, people on the channel, if you know what I'm going to ask a lot of questions about, and that is Terrorvision. Ted Nicolo, thank you so much for joining us. I really do appreciate it. Hey, thank you for having me, Matt. Oh, that's great. So um, I, I, I've kind of done a, a bit of digging into Terrorvision unofficially, just through being nosy over the years. And I, I just think it's such a fun film. It is everything about it works for me. And I know that you're very self-depreciating about this film when I've seen other interviews. Um, and, and I'll start by saying, you know, I'll, I'll undercut any self-depreciating that you're going to do <laughs> <laughs> because it was only open in cinemas for four days. <laughs> So, yeah. So, so yeah. that must have been very frustrating. It was, uh, yeah, it was one of the more disappointing experiences of my life because you pour so much energy and so much love into a movie, and you have such a wonderful time in the in the making of it. And when it's finished, you think, oh boy, this is really funny, and it, you know, my friends responded to it. But it went into the cinemas and very few people kind of understood what it was about or or had the right sensibility for it so it really tanked very quickly and you know just a small group of the audience really uh understood it got it and appreciated it and it took like a year for me to kind of recover my footing and as a filmmaker again and took several years for the for the kind of cult to grow around it and for kids to show it to their friends and their friends to show it to friends. And suddenly now it's what, 30, almost 30, almost 40 years later. And it's, and it's still kind of in people's minds. So, you know, it became from supreme disappointment to like, okay, this is pretty satisfying. That sounds very similar to how John Carpenter talks about the thing. You know, in the sense of it was a really traumatic experience for him. Um, yet people are constantly telling him how much they love it. <laughs> He's like, where were you? <laughs> yeah, and the thing is like, you know, I, I would have to say the thing's like one of the great horror films, whereas Terrorvision is like a, um, a kind of like a little bad boy of a movie. And, uh, you know, it was intended as that, you know. Yeah, yeah, the, the humour stands out. And I guess... It is a brave choice to, to lead with humor and horror. And, and I think it strikes that balance really well. Like you say, there are certain people who are going to kind of sit there open mouth. I, I watched it in a um, in 2020 at a film festival and it was quite quiet near the beginning, but the laughs grew and grew and grew. And then you could see people at the end <laughs> online buying it on their phone, <laughs> like straight away ordering it. Um, it, it has grown a cult, hasn't it, over uh, over the years? And sometimes people are sniffy about that word cult film, but sometimes it's great being on that little insider group of people who know about something and love something, and you don't want everybody to be in on the, on the coolness. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... it's uh... You know, it was intended to be like a movie that that a kid might watch on television, you know, on like and and wonder what in the hell that was, you know, and 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 so the, all the choices, aesthetic choices, kind of went toward making it something completely different than what than when what was in the cinemas at the time, and and maybe we went yeah, a little overboard on that. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> No, I was just thinking it almost like you mentioned E.T. E.T. is mentioned in the film. Um, it's like the anti-E.T. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I often wonder if maybe Steven Spielberg kind of quashed my career out of uh, anger that we made fun of his movie, you know. 
Um, but it was uh, we <laughs> gently poked fun at it because it did make me cry, just uh, just like uh, Jonathan Grimes says, you know. So, so I appreciated that film. Yeah, I, I, it's um, it's definitely of that era when, as a young man, I was going to see you know Ghostbusters in uh, the cinema and ET at the cinema, and you having these strong. I think Terrorvision had a cinematic release in the UK. Um, but when I did get hold of it and did see it, um, I kind of attached the, the monster itself um, as like a dog, like a big puppy dog. So I got into it straight away because I'm a dog person. I know that sounds a bit uh-huh. crazy, but I, I got into it. But... <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was um, kind of the intention. It, yeah, the, yeah, that was the intention, that, you know, that even feeding him from the from the dog bowl, feeding them pieces of charcoal, and um, yeah, yeah, I wanted him to be lovable and stupid and and terrifying too. Yeah, you could describe some of the characters as well as like lovable and stupid and like, <laughs> but but they are all they're all enhanced and like cartoony. Um, and I think that one of the things that makes it made it stand out for me, and when I go back and listen to um, Charles Band, um, his audio book and things like that about the film, this being on the De Laurentiis set um, really makes it a visual feast for the eyes. So there's lots of other elements that we'll talk about, but what were your first impressions when, when you went out to Italy and you saw the, what you had to work with? So for the production design, our, our production designer, Giovanni Natalucci, came to Los Angeles for, and we spent a few days kind of looking at locations and talking about kind of the, the style of kind of swinger houses in the San Fernando Valley. And um, then he went off and started creating. And it wasn't until I arrived in Italy for the pre-production in Italy that I walked on the stage and saw the sets. And... It, it kind of blew my mind because whatever I imagined, he had kind of taken it tenfold into something com- like an expressionistic crazy world, you know, and the, the living room with its sunken kind of conversation pit and the erotic art on the walls and the little bar with its like um, wallpaper. And then stepping onto the, to the pleasure dome, the, the jacuzzi room. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing when I saw that those sets, you know. Well, that's that's almost. I mean, for people who don't know about his career, um, you know, he he had some artistic uh, experience with films like Caligula, and Once Upon a Time in America, and From Beyond, and uh, you know, this is almost a, a combination of a kind of Caligula style and From Beyond style in, in terms of color. <laughs> And, and such, a, it, it, but but with a real sense of humor as well. Yeah, yeah. He uh, he really nailed the the tone of the screenplay, and and he did it, and kind of everyone else that was involved with the production, from the cast to the cinematographer Romano Albani, uh, everybody kind of just kind of layered onto that. And that's why I, I, I'm not self-deprecating necessarily, but uh, kind of yeah. give due to the people that helped me make that movie because yes. everybody plussed it in so many ways. Oh, for, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, Charles Band mentioned in his book that there was like a party atmosphere and were you all is this right because it could be you, you you disagree on this but you were you were kind of all put up in italian hotels uh what to, when you all originally met each other yeah basically uh a, a portion of us were staying at a little hotel a beach hotel in a town called torvionica which was about 20 minutes from the studio and it was right on the sand and had a beautiful terrace overlooking the water and one of the best kind of seafood restaurants in that area and um, so there was Garrett Graham and Sonny Davis Jr. and uh, Mary Warrenoff and uh, Cleve Hall, some of the people that were that were the monster uh, creators. And 
uh, John Grise and his girlfriend were staying in Rome and Diane Franklin uh, and her boyfriend, I think, were in Rome also. Uh, and uh, so it wasn't everybody on that patio, but it was enough of it of us that every evening, you know, I'd come back from the studio and the Italians are very kind of wonderful in the way that they kind of separate work from life and, and make room for life. So, you know, six o'clock every night we'd be wrapped drive back to the hotel, have a beer, watching the sunset, uh, and then dinner, you know, on a big long table and everybody would come down and there'd be plenty of wine. And uh, so it was, it was really like, like a long party, you know, and, and, you know, Garrett Graham was sort of going through like, uh, he was uh, uh, going sober at the time. So he wasn't so happy about all the drunken <laughs> shenanigans. Uh, but everybody else had a great time and he would come and eat dinner with us and there and, and so it was like really it for me shooting on location has that quality of like everything is about the movie and for for better or worse some movies are a little bit worse and the cast is a terrible thing to have to eat dinner with every night but uh in this case it, I, I was so excited about it being my first film and and everybody was so into the creation of it that it it really made the atmosphere exceptional it's interesting that you mention about you know kind of everybody coming together and 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 how important it is that each individual is um adds to it rather than sort of makes it you know difficult or take away because around the time you know empire making a lot of films with, with some really um, varied casts, and I, I, I was I was trying to think of some of the other actors who maybe a little bit more, let's say, challenging that were in some of the other productions at the same time. Um, and and one of the ones that that popped into my head was Klaus Kinski, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was thinking Klaus Kinski in Terrorvision might might have been a um, a jacuzzi um, accident <laughs> waiting to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Klaus Kinski might have murdered me, and that would not have been good. I was very lucky that we were making a comedy, and um, that everybody kind of came aboard so willingly and with enthusiasm. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, this Italian studio, this history of De Laurentiis, and, you know, and, and then also, I guess there's a rap party at a $40 million castle at the end of it as well so this is an unusual studio experience for you did you you know you'd made two films before this but i imagine they compared very differently yeah when um you know the the only films i'd done before this were i i had edited a lot of films for charlie band at that time i directed only one little portion of the movie called rage war uh and in that one, we shot like two days in the desert and I had to share my hotel room with one of the little people who played one of the drivers of the other car because there weren't enough hotel rooms for everybody. So uh, to suddenly go to Italy and be staying at this beach hotel in a kind of a suite um, with a terrace overlooking the water and uh, my cast all around me and driving into Rome every Saturday and Sunday to, to see the sights or go shopping. Um, I thought, wow, this is the way the rest of my life is going to be. You know, this is terrific. Uh, and it didn't turn out quite like that, but, uh, you know, it didn't turn out so bad. But but I didn't realize at the time how precious that experience was. And the studio was a little bit ramshackle at the time and the some of the sound stages were just cavernous empty places with a lot of junk scattered around and the back lot was just kind of piles of junk all over the place and the offices were just barely kind of getting furnished again uh but the atmosphere of the crew and the, there was a little bar where you could get you know your espresso and and everything about it was like like it's a magical experience shooting in, in Italy because they really appreciate their, their artists and their, they like to eat and they like to drink and they like to talk. And so it, it's a kind of an overall life experience there. 
That's really interesting. It reminds me um, briefly. My wife works in Spain, and I, I spent some time over there, and I visited some of the schools because I work in education. I was like, they were having breaks for food and going for siesta and having lots of you know conversations and taking their time over things. Obviously, their their, their finances of the country were terrible, but everyone was relaxed and having a great time. And it, it kind of yeah. remi- reminds me a bit of. <laughs> Yeah, every afternoon, four o'clock. The, the it, we were shooting in the summertime, and it was really hot, and the soundstage wasn't air conditioned. So every afternoon, about four o'clock, here would come a production assistant with popsicles for everybody. You know, we would just stop, and everybody to eat an ice cream, and then we'd resume work. So it, it was like a real. I mean, it's like the the Italian kind of generosity was evident everywhere. That's lovely. That's really nice to hear, and I think that like. You know, we, we often talk now in modern modern parlance, uh, work-life balance and trying to find that work-life balance. And there's sometimes the, just the sort of the simplicity of um, working to live rather than living to work. You know, it's like, it, it sounds like they've got that balance. They had that balance many years ago. Yeah, and they maintain it very well. Yeah, yeah. Mm, that sounds, that's really, that's really interesting. And, you know, um, One of the other areas, I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit, one of the other areas that stands out um, is is the choice of music. Um, Obviously, Richard Band has a hand to play in many um, Charles Band productions, but I I notice in this film there's a real love for metal and and metal culture and horror and metal go together so, so well. Was that something that when you were writing it, you, you had in your mind, you, you were, you know, almost the same sort of sensibility as a Bill and Ted or something like that? You know, I think I was influenced at the time because uh, we were going to see music every every weekend uh, in Los Angeles. It was a club, mostly a club called Club Lingerie that was on Sunset. And there would be Mary Warnoff kind of hanging around and, and hearing music. And that's where I heard the Fibonacci's for the first time. And I was never a real big metal fan, but to me, metal works with, uh, with that era and is really good for poking fun at too. Uh, yeah. And so my appreciation for metal was more about the comedy in the story and kind of finding the right kind of boyfriend for Suzy Putterman, who was sort of like a new wavy kind of Cindy Lauper kind of girl, and 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 the idea of a kid named O. D. Riley to me was just too much to to pass up. So so every all the pieces kind of fit together in a way of just trying to find the right balance of characters that you could appreciate and and enjoy watching, but also not become too emotionally attached to since yeah. they were all going to get slaughtered by the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good point. And, and I, I was just thinking, she, she ended up being surrounded by metalheads from Bill and Ted to O.D. Like, uh-huh. <laughs> she, 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 she ended up being, um, you know, spending a lot of time with people going, dude. <laughs> yeah, she was quite a quite a young actress, you know, and she was so excited to, to play Susie Putterman because it kind of gave her a chance to expand a little bit on the kind of romantic dewy kind of girl that that she had played before um yeah. and when she came to italy and we and it came time to go okay so what does she look like you know and and, and the costumer and the makeup people we spent like a day a long long day just trying out outfits and layers of stuff because i really love costumes that have a lot of textures and and many different layers and and her hair, no matter what we did with one wig or two wigs, it just didn't look extreme enough. And so we ended up having to pile so many wigs on her head and spray paint them so many different colors um, until we kind of found the right, the right kind of over the top look for her. And, and she was so wonderful playing not only kind of the bubbly daughter, but also when she becomes the the kind of greedy businesswoman, you know, and, and yeah. the mean older sister, you know, everything about her was wonderful. And when she works with her younger brother, when she works with uh, Chad Allen's character, that, that's quite unusual as well, where you, they actually pair up and, you know, it's, it's almost like this is what we've been training for. 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really, neither one likes their parents very much, and they're yeah. looking for a way to make enough money to get the hell out of there. <laughs> There's moments there where I, I was laughing at, you know, where the, the, the parents are so enamored with swingers culture and so switched on that they're throwing their children into a big locker, a big bomb shelter, and padlocking them in. You know, there's... <laughs> that always tickles me, always tickles me, that moment where it's almost like booting them in the door. <laughs> Mary Warnock was so uh, great in that role because basically um, I, I auditioned her for a different character. I auditioned her for the... For the um, Medusa character, and she was the one who suggested herself for uh, for um, Mrs. Putterman, and uh, and it, it was like, wow, that would be amazing because I love her as an actress, and I love her as a persona, and the thought of her having a role as mom in the movie was like incredible. And the great thing is, she is the least kind of maternal. A uh, person that you could ever meet. <laughs> so when it came time to torturing Chad, it was real. <laughs> get away, yeah, get away, kid. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's um, that that kind of thing. I don't know if people are as uh, you know whether they remember that that was such a strange time where talking about swingers and key parties and all these kind of things were in the mainstream culture they were kind of talked about on chat shows as punchlines for jokes and things like that that's a really strange <laughs> strange thing to become mainstream isn't it <laughs> yeah yeah um, and i guess it was it's just our our curiosity about sexuality our curiosity about things that kind of break the boundaries and yeah. i guess the the 80s was a time of that you know and it, it seems all just so kind of normal now. Um, but back then it was really like it, it piqued people's curiosity. And and I sort of searched, you know, swinger stuff, uh, survivalist uh, things, which was also big back then, yes. and tried to, to create a, a story that would kind of incorporate all these elements of kind of 80s curiosity culture. This is it. it, it... It, it does, even though obviously we're talking science fiction, horror, comedy, it is, it is of its time in that sense, isn't it? Where, you know, it, 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 I was watching a documentary about, um, about comedy last night, and as I was watching it, they were talking about, you know, being more accepting, more inclusive, uh, and then the AIDS epidemic, and, you know, everybody went back and became more conservative, and fears, and fears of nuclear war, and you know, around that time, all, all these things tie in to what uh, what 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 turn up on the screen. I guess if we're talking the seventies, we're talking the horrors of Vietnam, and that's why we get things like "I Spit on Your Grave" and things like that. So, actually, television really is of its time, isn't it? I think it's it's super of its time. It's it's kind of incorporating popular culture of its time. It's uh, taking. I grew up in the 50s and grew up loving kind of science fiction movies of the 50s and, you know, atomic uh, pollution and all of that. And so all of that's kind of mixed into it, too. And yeah. um, the idea of paranoia and uh, and, um, and the idea of kind of uh, contact with alien cultures and what would that be like and how would it be like if we're so stupid that we don't even take it seriously because television has kind of polluted the airwaves so badly. So uh, it was, I'm not an intellectual filmmaker and, and uh, I don't like pursue a theme necessarily, but I'm kind of like a intuitive mind that all of these things kind of attach themselves in a way that's not, you couldn't call it like a super intentional uh, satire or parody of the culture, but it, it becomes that because it's all it's all there in 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 a way. This is this is when when I when I used to teach writing and people would say write you know the big things were write what you know, write what you know isn't like I got up I put some toast in the toaster. It's like writing what you know can be television. <laughs> and I was thinking 
you know, th this is kind of exactly, you, you explained it so much better than I ever could, you know, kind of being an amalgamation of all of the influences and things that are around you. And then the, it does feel genuine then, doesn't it? It does feel real because, for example, like the Pluthar character, you can see that being based on you sitting as a child watching those kind of characters. Yeah, um, and in fact, uh, some of my some of the movies that really kind of appealed to me as a kid, I was able to put into television, like Robot Monster, the, the stupid gorilla with a space helmet movie, uh, um, and especially um, uh, Earth versus Flying Saucers, which to me was the movie that, that got away because I saw the trailer in a drive-in theater when I was a little kid, and I thought, wow, that is... That's the everything I want to see in a science fiction movie is cool looking flying saucers and destruction. Uh, and it, for some reason, never made it to Dallas, which was my hometown. So it wasn't until I was at University of Texas that I was able to start a little film society in order just to get that 16 millimeter print and watch the film. So uh, we were really lucky to be able to, to kind of put uh, the movies in the film too and, and it really is a film about everything that i loved and and the the movies that kind of haunted me as a childhood as a child like um invaders from mars the the original one to me was like the perfect blend of like childhood paranoia and german expressionism and and uh and kind of doofusy Martians too, you know, so it was really, and that was the kind of movie that I would see as a kid on TV and, and go, wow, that's, what is that? That's like a nightmare. That's a, my own nightmare. And, and so I was trying to put all of that into television too. Right. That's really interesting because I think films from around that time, maybe a bit before the films that we think of now, like plan nine to laugh at, but actually, there are films from around that era and a little bit after it that are that were absolutely petrifying and really scary for for children to watch. It wasn't, you know, like quote unquote bad movies. There were movies there that scared the hell out of people too. Yeah, the, I mean, Invaders from Mars to me was like really a haunting movie. You know, just the thought that you would be kind of standing alone against all the adults in your life and they're all being taken over. To me, that was, in a way, it's kind of what's going on in television too. And nobody believes Sherman um, no. throughout the film. Um, so I tried to take all of that and put it into a, a form of comedy because in fact, I, I kind of understood from being an editor for so long uh, of Charlie Band movies with John Beekler, uh, uh, Creature Effects. I kind of knew what John was capable of and what the drawbacks might be for the for the creature. And um, so I kind of pushed the limits of his artists and all the sculptors that worked with him to kind of create something that was uh, a monster, but really funny and and asymmetrical and uh, could be lovable, but also have elements like pincers, which to me are the most terrifying kind of um, anatomical thing and tentacles. And um, so so we kind of argued a lot and and finally arrived at the at the look of the hungry beast, which, you know, was like a big pain in the ass to kind of actually maneuver about on the set and puppeteer it. But um, it, it kind of matched the, the kind of uh, over the top quality of the characters and the set. And it, it was it all just kind of came together in a beautiful way. Wow, that's really interesting. I, I was actually going to lead into a question because I, I'm a massive admirer of the, of the, of the late great John Carl B. Clare. Um, Cellar Dweller particularly is a film I think that doesn't get enough credit in terms of you know we have a lot of comic book movies now and I'm of an age where seeing any comic book movie when I was a kid or anything to do with comic books was amazing now they're, they're everywhere but <laughs> Cellar Dweller was a, was a perfect um, from the page to the screen it, on the screen but he 
everything he touched seemed to just be so gooey and bright and fun and creative. He, he must have been an incredible collaborator to work with. He was, I, you know, uh, I have mixed uh, emotions about about that. I, I he was he was really talented, and his the the sculptors that worked with him were really enthusiastic young people just starting out. Um, I had edited Ghoulies uh, previous to Terrorvision, and those creatures were very limited in what they could do, and 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 editing them was really a matter of finding just a moment when the jaw flapped at the right time as the head turned so that they looked alive and, and it's i guess it's that way with puppeteering always it's just to, to pick the frames that work um but there was kind of a a joke that that went around that you know all the creatures of john beekler kind of had looked like john beekler in a way <laughs> and, and so I, I wanted to avoid that uh, for Terrorvision, and um, the uh, we got into a lot of fights about it in, in the beginning, and uh, as we started de designing the character, the, the creature, because I really wanted the asymmetrical, I really wanted like the stupid and uh, and also deadly, and all of the the appendages too, and he didn't quite get it at first. But I think Cleve Hall and some of the people that worked with him probably got it in a more uh, in a better way, and and eventually he came around to okay, so wow. it's going to have one big eye, one small eye, one tentacle, and and uh, he gave it his all, you know, and it was it was incredible. The the but the creature travels with a gigantic canister of uh of uh, methacellulose or something it's sort of like sex lubricant to slather on it because the latex at that time was too dry looking and and right. needed needed like the sheen of of uh moisture <laughs> now that makes that makes perfect sense because people who, who are buying the prop gremlins are finding that they're all crumbling and falling apart now and they've spent lots of money on buying them and <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sure the television creature must be just dust by now too, because <laughs> the 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 lubricant would kind of dry and crust over. So by the next day, you'd have to kind of wet it down and and do it again. And everywhere he walked on the set, there was like a puddle. I mean, in a way, it was perfect. Yes. <laughs> for yeah. for the idea of an unruly house pet, because <laughs> everywhere he went. <laughs> It was behind him a puddle of uh, goop. Um, it's, the, it's, it's, it's the era of goop. Is the era? <laughs> <laughs> it so. was. It was, and it was fun, you know. But but it was. It was seriously a uh, industrial size uh, canister of. That's so interesting. People are crying out for that now. Who who love, you know, who, who are kind of tired of of the uncanny valley of, of certain CGI. They they watched. And, and rave about films like Society or um, From Beyond or, or you know, or, or, or television and, and kind of love the stickiness of it because you can't, it's what, you, you can't ape that in with CGI really without it looking strange. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's, in a way, I appreciate the idea of having things literally on the set and, and, for the actors, I think it's really helpful. Um, there are some photos that I have of me directing the the hungry beast and kind of looking in his mouth uh, at the puppeteers. But you you could talk to him and it would feel like you were really talking to another character on the set. And and um, there's nothing like it. You know, I think CG has like gone from meticulous attempting to create life to like holy crap we don't have much money and we don't have much time and kind of uh short changing the the cg effects a little bit so now everything looks like an animated film so, um, so, do so you, do you, sorry i was just thinking have you ever found yourself in that position where you're kind of directing like a broomstick with a paper plate on it or something and thought i i, I i'm not sure what what's happening here <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the film Dragon World uh, that I did, that was like a family children's film that we shot in the UK. Um, we had like 
a giant dragon head that would be for the close-ups and he was animatronic and he was really amazing uh but then the rest was going to be um stop motion animation and so yeah we always had the dragon stick and people looking at it and that was the eye line and and it's for me you know i'd rather shoot on location instead of a green screen uh, that was going to be added later because there's a certain challenge that that seems to me to be part of cinema from the very beginning to finding a place and dressing a place so that it looks like it's part of your story uh whereas shooting on a green screen just seems to me like okay it's great because you're directing actors but they don't have anything to relate to uh on the set so so for me, the more real, and maybe it's because all I've done is like low budget movies, which you have no choice but to but to shoot on location. But to me, that's the kind of challenge of filmmaking. Yeah. That, yes, and, and I, 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 I'm kind of. Um, it's interesting. I bet you never thought at the time people would be having nostalgia for that group and that. Uh, <laughs> it's a very, it's a very strange thing to, to have nostalgia for, but people love the idea that it feels you can touch something it's it's more tangible yeah yeah and it's and it takes the light exactly like the light on the set and uh, i don't know i mean it's it's limited by the ability of the animatronics or the puppeteers to actually give it life and so there there are certain downfalls to it you yes. know that you can't you know you just have to keep shooting until you find a moment that seems lifelike um but that's kind of the challenge of making a movie, even with actors trying to shoot until you get those moments. So, sure. yeah, yeah. So I, I've got like a range of kind of, there might be quick fire questions or there might not be, I'm not sure, but just things that maybe, like we spoke before we started recording about questions that maybe people haven't asked about television before. So some of them, maybe they have, maybe I'm being arrogant and thinking that they have not um, And I've just not seen that interview. But um, one of the questions I was going to ask was about um, the legacy of the film. Um, um, I'm from the north of England, and there was a band uh, from Sheffield called Terror Vision. I, I wonder if you, how aware you were of them when they started up, or uh, you know, because they had um, quite a big hit over here. They were always quite underground, and then they had one big hit called Tequila, which was really big. No, I knew of them because if I Googled Terrorvision, they would come up too. And and so and they named themselves after the movie, yes? Yeah, Weren't they inspired yeah. by it? Yeah, so that to me I take that as a like one of the great compliments, you know, really. Um oh. and even to this day, you know, my son plays in a band called Drab Majesty and when they're on tour he'll meet people who uh are fans you know among the kind of hipster crowd of the of the clubs that they play in and run into people who are random fans of television so so to me i know that the movie continues to kind of be spread from friend to friend i think i think as well people attach themselves to that od character um <laughs> as, as well like he, he's a character that makes people smile obviously the, the performance is wonderful but the, the costume and the the writing is great, um, and and like you say, it's it's that fine balance between having fun with something. And if there's ever going to be a group or a type of music that people are going to be okay with and, and accept that, it's going to be people who are into metal. They're very like I I used to go to a lot of metal concerts when I was a kid. I, I had like a, a older friends, so they took me to Judas Priest and Scorpions and things like. That. And I never once felt different or left out. I was just accepted. So I guess that's perfect, isn't it? When you when you when you're uh, accepted by the metalheads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh, you know John Grise, uh when he came into audition, he was obviously older than the character should have been. Um, but he came in with a long curly hair, black wig and, and uh, metal and a, a leather jacket. And he was just so funny. And he's such a great actor and so great at playing kind of characters with an immense amount of confidence and a lot of like kind of uh, um, not stupidity, but kind of unawareness, you know, yes. and he was 
like so great and pl playing off chad allen when he first comes in to meet the family and playing off garrett and mary mary warnoff uh, uh he was he just brought something to that character that was just perfect you know well even for smaller characters that he's played are remembered in a bigger way in terms of like screen time to being memorable the balance is is, is crazy like even uncle rico's not around a lot in Napoleon Dynamite, but everyone remembers Uncle Rico. <laughs> oh yeah, he was like incredible in that film. Yeah, and that and that's another film where you know we're talking, well, what twenty five years maybe twenty years. Um, so these are these are really in, sort of films that put smiles on people's faces, and and and, and you'll go back and rewatch. There's a real rewatchability to television. Um, do you think it would have been different if some of the other people who, and, and you can tell me these are completely wrong, but I heard names like Harry Shearer and Belinda Carlisle and even Cindy Lauper mentioned. Are any of these true or is that just kind of... To Belinda the Carlisle came in to, to audition. Uh, Harry Shearer kind of read the script and turned us down. Um, I think we were so lucky to not have Harry Shearer because he has a certain more caustic kind of uh, sense mm -hmm. of humor. Whereas Garrett is perfect at playing kind of the clueless bozo kind of uh, <laughs> egomaniac <laughs> that he is, you know? Um, yeah. And uh, I think uh, Belinda Carlisle would have brought us a greater kind of attention in the, in the world. But I think Diane, gave us like a character that was like really appealing and funny at the same time. Uh, there was a moment uh, when I wanted Frank Zappa to do the, the score and and he agreed to come in. So I, I, I sat down in the screening room at, at uh, Empire, just me, Frank Zappa, his wife and his kid and watched the movie. And uh, when it was over, he said, well, so how, when do you need the score? And, you know, of course, in those days, it, you know, Charlie wanted everything right away. And so there wasn't a lot of time. And so he ended up turning us down, I think, mostly because of the time factor. But I wonder what, you know, you can't help but wonder what the movie would have been like with the Frank Zappa score, too. Yeah. You know, yeah, you um, feel, I feel like he, he's his sensibility matches. <laughs> Quite well. <laughs> yeah, I was influenced by Zappa from high school on, you know, and loved loved his band, um, and and so yeah, he's a he's another thing that was swimming around in my head when I was writing the script. Um, but we were really lucky to get the Fibonacci's who did the the television theme song and yes. some of the incidental music in the film, and they were kind of like an intellectual art rock band that that we used to see at uh, Club Lingerie, and. Uh, Maggie Song's voice is just so kind of perfect for the ethereal kind of um, uh, piece of music that they wrote, you know, and John Dentino was a great uh, composer. And so so we were super lucky that, that we got what we did. And, and Rick Band kind of then took, you know, he's like so experienced. Maybe his music, in my opinion, was uh, pushed the humor a little bit too hard and could have backed off on that. And didn't the, the the score didn't need to be goofy because everything happened on the screen <laughs> <laughs> was so goofy. Um, but you know, it, it works for the movie and the movie creates a, an atmosphere that's unlike any other, which was its downfall and it's saving grace in the end. It's interesting you say that because his, his scores are, very much on the nose with whatever you need. So, like, his reanimator score is very Hitchcockian. Uh, <laughs> like, exactly. Um, and I guess there isn't... I, I guess when you're making films so quickly, you need to get that instant flavour of what a film's about. So that that's his stock and trade, isn't it? He's, he's so talented, he can watch a film or listen to a film or get notes and go... I'll give you the essence of what you want. Oh, he's great. He, he did a score for me for a, a short movie that I did a few years ago called Don't Let Her In. And, and you know, you give him a few bits of direction. And for me, it was, I don't really want it to be musical. I want it to be more ambient. And, and <clears throat> even though that's kind of not, he's more like an orchestral, melodic kind of composer. 
but he gave me a score that was like really, really powerful for the movie. And and Terravision, maybe that score is perfect for the film because it really, you know, it it takes you to a world that's unique unto itself. Yeah, and that's it. Just bouncing back to, um, and I hope you don't mind me bouncing around all over the place, but bouncing back to Garrett Graham and um, character and his interaction with Alejandro Ray's character, how you when you mentioned about him being like unaware and sort of in love with himself and that, that he doesn't realize that that, that, that the um, Spiro is enamored with him. It's like not even any, he's just like, he likes my house. He loves my jacuzzi. He just thinks I'm, <laughs> I've made a new friend. <laughs> The humor in that I've made a new friend until it slowly <laughs> dawns on him. Is that something that was on the page? Because if it is on the page, he, he he adds so much to that with his facial expressions. Yeah, the the scenes are that are in the film are pretty much as scripted, you know, from from a dialogue point of view and from reactions. But for me, for me, the moment when uh, Raquel tells him that uh, Spiro's into boys. And the, <laughs> I remember as we were shooting it, I said, Garrett, just take a really long moment there for that thing to sink in. <laughs> and uh, he's such a talented uh, comic actor that he's, that he's able to take a direction like that and then just plus it, you know, 10 times and make it even better, you know, for me, when he goes in, he goes, Spiro, there, hey, pal, there's something we got to discuss. Um, it, it to me, you know, I, I one person kind of accused the film of being like homophobic, and and a friend of mine actually accused the film of being uh, homophobic. And my answer to that is, uh, it, it's not homophobic; it's misanthropic, intentionally misanthropic, in that I wanted to create a world where you wouldn't really be that upset if the people end up dead at the hands yeah. of the monster. So, uh, so yeah, I think, um, in, in a way, the, the, I wonder actually, you know, if the film was released today, if you could, if it would be like kind of another mu thing of being kind of canceled because it's too mm. out there, you know? Do you know what? I, I don't I, personally, I don't think so. And the, the reason I don't think so is, you know, when people say this film's not getting made and this wouldn't get made, I, I often think that they would. It's just that there's so many films being made. <laughs> and there's such a, you know, on phones and so, that, that these films are being made. It's just that sometimes people are not noticing the films that are being made. Um, I, I get what you're saying, though. I don't know. I, I think surely we, we don't want to get rid of humour from being unaware that somebody finds you attractive <laughs> yeah yeah i mean to me it was like everybody played their role so uh so in such an innocent way you know and alejandro ray to me was like a revelation you know to, yes. to get oh. to get the guy who was in uh, uh the flying nun to be in our movie and he was so uh happy to have the role and was like you know, people were happy to come there. I mean, part of it was, hey, you want to spend, you know, four weeks in, in Rome? Uh, very few people will say no to that, you know, but he yeah. came and he was so gracious and so funny and getting in that uh, jacuzzi, the water was ice cold and yet he, oh, wow. he did it, you know, and so uh, I have to give it to him. There's a lot, that, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of moments there where, you have to, you know, if someone's not throwing themselves into it, you would notice. And he is the medallion. Well, they're both medallion men, I guess. But, um, the, you know, that <laughs> my, I've got pictures of my dad in the 70s. And, like, you know, <laughs> it's very similar, big, big co collars and stuff. And it's just, it, it is hilarious. It is hilarious to look at, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the fashions and when, when Garrett Graham is kind of making fun of, of OD's style while he's also layering on several medallions and putting on his thing. And, and we sped up the, the film a little bit just to give him a little more goofiness. But um, he, I mean, he's physically so amazing. And, and Mary Warrenoff, when we had her in and cast her, 
she was so excited to be able to be working with Garrett Graham, you know, because she knew, you know, what what they would be capable of doing, you know, if they were working together. And then her Naga hide, her Naga hide dress, you know, it was like if you look behind her in the photographs, like uh, clothespins all down her spine to kind of uh, pull it tight. <laughs> But she was she was amazing. They're, they're really good. I mean, the, the scene where they're all in bed, um, and that that is a, is probably I would say one of the most scary or, or, or upsetting <laughs> but funny moments. In, in it's similar to society where they're a kind of having the sort of the orgy and society where you you you're like your eyes are popping out of your head. Um, that, that that that's sort of so such a strange balance to strike isn't it it's like funny gooey <laughs> and and quite scary and weird at the same time like unsettling i suppose is the word yeah i don't know uh, and maybe that you know i i wasn't aware what a landmine i was kind of stepping into trying to create a monster movie comedy um mm -hmm. because i don't think that's a real popularly recognized <laughs> genre you know and uh and and in a way that maybe have been the kind of commercial downfall of the film in its uh, early years was that it was like well, the people that came to see a horror movie about a creature coming out of your tv set were not happy to see a movie about a swinger family and a heavy metal boy you know uh, and so so and the people that could appreciate a comedy uh, we're not there to see a gooey monster, you know, killing people. So, so you narrow the audience, the potential audience down quite a bit when you do that. And mm. I wrote it kind of a, to be a movie that, that would appeal to kind of a stoner crowd, you know, and, and, and yet have a kid as one of the main characters again, you know, what was I thinking in that decision, you know, at, but I wanted a movie that would be, that that would haunt a 12 year old because i knew that was kind of ultimately the audience for charlie band movies was 12 year old boys you know and uh, so i think we succeeded but it took a while for people to kind of catch up to it oh yeah i mean it's funny because people who say watch the arcade film and i'm not disparaging the arcade film but when i watched arcade as a, as a kid i think it's maybe 92 or something i, I was like this is a lot darker and a lot less bright than I, than I want to see. Um, where when I watch television, it's like um, an assault on the senses that a young person does <laughs> want does want to sort of stare at. And I, one of the things I was thinking of was like was um, the Medusa character. Was was that was that directly based on Elvira? Was that because Elvira was huge? People forget how huge Elvira was. Like, um, was she ever discussed as actually being in the film or was it just based on horror hosts in general? Well, I grew up with a horror host that was like a goofy man. Uh, and Elvira kind of took it and created a whole new kind of a horror host and a horror hostess that was sexy and funny. And, and uh, so uh, Medusa definitely kind of takes its or takes her origins from elvira i don't think we ever actually said hey what about if we get elvira for this because uh, we wanted the movie to exist in its own universe right um yes and so we got jennifer richards who was like really funny and and had the the bosoms to kind of like out elvira elvira <laughs> she could back it up <laughs> <laughs> Because did, did she, what, like I was just thinking, if there was to be a sequel, hers is a character to be explored even further, isn't she? Uh, you know. Yeah, because she's carrying the monster at the end of the movie with her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and like, I guess if money was no object, you'd want to see the home planet as well. <laughs> oh, I yeah. certainly, I certainly would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think maybe the home planet would be in, in a, in disarray, you know, since the since their emissary Pluthar ended up dying on Earth, uh, and yeah. you know the home planet was 
another Giovanni Natalucci creation, you know, was supposed to be, okay, we'll see the, the original signal uh, go astray. Uh, and he put that upside down uh, Star Trek uh, spaceship yes. <laughs> on the set, you know, and, and, and right away, you know, you're watching a movie that comes from another universe, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, we've, we've kind of toyed with the idea of sequels to terror vision and everybody's now like grown much older. And, and so it's almost like we'd have to have some cameos of the original characters and create a whole new universe that, the, that the hungry beast is, is, um, exploiting but yeah it would be fun to do i don't i i don't know what the audience would be for it you know it's know interesting like... uh, interesting i heard you mention this when when um jt uh, horror discussions and, and larry horror cat dad two <laughs> two of my favorite people they interviewed you and i heard you talk about the um the the, the uh the sequel potential sequel and um i was you know, I, I don't know. It's it's like one of those things. I think there would be a massive audience, but then I am that audience, so I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so audience of one, yeah, yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I, there's plenty of times I've been an audience of one in the cinema. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder watching Donny Darko and just watching it on my own, and it was only when they re-released it after the success of the song, um, where it, it hit. And I was thinking, wow. why, why, why am I here on my own? So it, it's, yeah, who knows? It's a, it's a strange. Yeah, yeah. I mean, alchemy. it's like, yeah. And, and whatever kind of zeitgeist that we captured in, in the original Terror Vision, uh, you know, the question is, we, we wouldn't want to try to capture that again, but something new that would be more contemporary. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting dilemma. And, you know, um, we I, explore I, it. I'd love to explore that. I, 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 you know, I'm a bit of a what do they call it, um, armchair quarterback. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, it, it's, it's often something I thought about. Um, but in, in terms of, I, I know I don't know if you see it this way, but I really enjoy bad channels, and I always see it as a spiritual successor to television, but with a nice twist on the shock jock Howard Stern kind of era. You've got wasp in there. You've got gooey monsters. You've got the sort of stay tuned television feel to it. Was Bad Channels something that you, you got to, ex to explore or, or flex the same muscles as you did in television? Yeah, in a way, you know, after television, uh, you know, Charlie Band would, you know, propose, hey, what about, what if we do this movie? What if we do that movie? And, and, uh, one of the films he proposed to me was Bad Channels and uh, Alien he coming wrote out. it right, didn't he? Did well, he, he write it with you or? No, he basically uh, in those days would uh, engage an artist to, to do a poster. And ah. the poster would be his, uh, how he would sell the movie at uh, like internationally, uh, pre-sell the movie. And <laughs> so he, he had this idea for a, uh, you know, basically the poster was probably an alien and a bunch of women that he shrunk into little jars. And it wasn't the alien that we came up with in the film, but, and it wasn't the jar shape that we had, but that was, that was the way he would propose a movie to a director like me. And, and I turned it down for a couple of years, for several years after that, because I felt like it was too much like Terror Vision, and I had kind of done what I could do with that idea. At a certain point, I got hungry enough and and went, uh, okay, so wait a minute, I could do some you know faux music videos, um, have an alien, uh, yeah, okay, so so I'll do it. And and uh, it was it was like a. Yeah, we it was sort of flex trying to flex the same muscles of humor and contemporary kind of zeitgeist uh, material. Uh, we were it was cool to have Martha Quinn as as a DJ, you know, and uh, or as a reporter. Uh, it somehow and the sets I thought were really cool, and the alien was kind of cool. Um, having Martha Quinn as the as the uh, reporter. 
uh, was to me like kind of a real honor because I sort of had been seeing her on MTV for years. Uh, and Paul Hip as uh, our DJ was amazing. You know, he was like a really yeah, funny actor, really energetic. Um, and uh, I brought some people over from that I had met in in uh, Santa Fe when I was doing like this TV series, Italian TV series called Lucky Luke. Um, brought them to work in the art department and uh, uh, some of the actors from there. And and so it to me it was like a family affair making that movie. Adolfo Bartoli, the cinematographer, who is really talented and who I've done a, like dozen movies with maybe by now um and so so it was it was really fun to do and the locations were cool and we spent a lot of nights up on the mountaintop where the where the radio tower was uh i don't know that the film is as success as successful kind of artistically or com comically or monster wise as television mm -hmm. but um it people like it and or, or some people like it and so i'm kind of like, like pleased with that you know yeah I, I felt like um yeah I, I would agree with that i would say it's maybe not as realized as television but a hell of a lot of fun and a film that i revisit quite a lot um, oh interesting yeah um it, it, and then again maybe i am a sucker for because I, I remember seeing stay tuned in the cinema and loving this idea of really strange channels being beamed into televisions and like almost um and then even things like sketch based uh, like kentucky fried movie or something like that where you're jumping from thing to thing so bad channels television they're all in this lovely sweet spot for me uh but but i would say you know without i don't want to i don't want to television for me is just a perfect movie for me so I think television, you know, since it was my first opportunity to direct a feature, you know, I sort of like threw everything possible into it that, that I could imagine at the time. And uh, with bad channels, it was it seemed a little more limiting uh, monster coming out of the radio and kidnapping mm. women. Um, but we were lucky to get Psychotic Symphony, the band that, that plays in the hospital room in the hospital. The locations were cool. Uh, yes. And and so, for me, it was a lot of fun making that film. Yeah, it's 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 um it's one of my favorite sort of Empire Bad uh, Empire Full Moon kind of. Oh, that's art, very you know, cool. Oh. I really do enjoy, enjoy it. Um, it's one that when when people when I mean, I've been on videos sort of ranking, you know, Charles Band films or ranking things, uh, it's it's often one. That I mention alongside um, Cellar Dweller as one that maybe people need to go and check out um, because for, for whatever reason Cellar Dweller is one that that sometimes people completely forget about, which I think is is wild. Um, and, and bad channels, I, I like. Well, if you like television, <laughs> I'm like I'm like the human Netflix. You know, it's like if you like <laughs> if you like this, then <laughs> yeah, man, spread the word, spread yeah. the word, please. <laughs> <laughs> We complain. We complain about the weather constantly. Oh uh, man! I shot uh, when we shot Dragon World. We were staying primarily in Sheffield and shooting in Bakewell. Uh, yeah, and home of the Bakewell Tart. Yeah, yeah, and it was <laughs> it was wonderful. But man, the weather was like really knocked us off schedule badly. Yeah, it's funny. Um, Terravision are from around Sheffield and, and around that <laughs> around that area as well. So. Uh, <laughs> you, you, little did you know it. You were in, you, in a few years' time. You were going to influence um, a band. Yeah, <laughs> from, I know. From that that's same very area. cool. To me, uh, that's like the coolest of all. You know. Yeah. It's um it, uh, really to, to, be, to be honest. Just just before we, we kind of stop that, all, all, all I wanted to say is just thank you so much for for making a film that I love. So many films that so many people love. Um, I. I We'll always watch your films um, and, and find them immensely entertaining. And just, I just really appreciate your time and just being so gracious with your time and, and, and kind of open about the, the making of the, the of these films. With that, you know, um, I just felt like we were kind of there's no pretension. We were just chatting about films, which is just one of my favorite things to do. So thank you so yeah. much. 
Me too, man. Thank you so much for having me and, and also for spreading the word, you know, like keep it oh. up. Yeah, I was listening to you talk about the way you make films and your love of film and how those things all come together. Uh, it's like a fan's dream. So, um, yeah, I, 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 won't, I won't repeat myself too much, but thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. I know you've, uh, you've got a lot on and you fit me in. It's morning for you and it's, um, it's evening for me. And um, it's been a lovely evening. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you, Matt. Okay. You too. Thanks, Ted. Okay, take care. Take care. Bye-bye.